Locking J, Disc 5. Chapter 11. What will break me? This is the question that consumes me over the next three days as we wait to be released from our prison of safety. What will break me into a million pieces so that I am beyond repair, beyond usefulness? I mention it to no one, but it devours my waking hours and weaves itself throughout my nightmares. Four more bunker missiles fall over this period, all massive, all very damaging, but there's no urgency to the attack. The bombs are spread out over the long hours, so that just when you think the raid is over, another blast sends shockwaves through your guts. It feels more designed to keep us in lockdown than to decimate 13. Cripple the district, yes. Give the people plenty to do to get the place running again. But destroy it, no. Coyne was right on that point. You don't destroy what you want to acquire in the future. I assume what they really want in the short term is to stop the airtime assaults and keep me off the televisions of Panem. We receive next to no information as to what is happening. Our screens never come on, and we get only brief audio updates from COIN about the nature of the bombs. Certainly, the war is still being waged. But as to its status, we're in the dark. Inside the bunker, cooperation is the order of the day. We adhere to a strict schedule for meals and bathing, exercise and sleep. Small periods of socialization are granted to alleviate the tedium. Our space becomes very popular because both children and adults have a fascination with Buttercup. He attains celebrity status with his evening game of Crazy Cat. I created this by accident a few years ago, during a winter blackout. You simply wiggle a flashlight beam around on the floor, and Buttercup tries to catch us. I'm petty enough to enjoy it, because I think it makes him look stupid. Inexplicably, everyone here thinks he's clever and delightful. I'm even issued a special set of batteries, an enormous waste, to be used for this purpose. The citizens of Thirteen are truly starved for entertainment. It's on the third night during our game that I answer the question eating away at me. Crazy Cat becomes a metaphor for my situation. I am Buttercup. PETA, the thing I want so badly to secure, is the light. As long as Buttercup feels he has the chance of catching the elusive light under his paws, he's bristling with aggression. That's how I've been since I left the arena with Peter alive. When the light goes out completely, Buttercup's temporarily distraught and confused, but he recovers and moves on to other things. That's what would happen if Peter died. But the one thing that sends Buttercup into a tailspin is when I leave the light on, but put it hopelessly out of his reach, high on the wall, beyond even his jumping skills. He paces below the wall, wails, and can't be comforted or distracted. He's useless until I shut the light off. That's what Snow is trying to do to me now, only... I don't know what form his game takes. Maybe this realization on my part is all Snow needs. Thinking that PETA was in his possession and being tortured for rebel information was bad, but thinking that he's being tortured specifically to incapacitate me is unendurable. And it's under the weight of this revelation that I truly begin to break. After Crazy Cat, we're directed to bed. The power's been coming and going. Sometimes the lamps burn at full brightness. Other times we squint at one another in the brownouts. At bedtime, they turn the lamps to near darkness and activate safety lights in each space. Prim, who's decided the walls will hold up, 
snuggles with Buttercup on the lower bunk, my mother's on the upper. I offer to take a bunk, but they make me keep to the floor mattress since I flail around so much when I'm sleeping. I'm not flailing now as my muscles are rigid with the tension of holding myself together. The pain over my heart returns, and from it I imagine tiny fissures spreading out into my body, through my torso, down my arms and legs, over my face, leaving it crisscrossed with cracks. One good jolt of a bunker missile, and I could shatter into strange razor-sharp shards. When the restless, wiggling majority has settled into sleep, I carefully extricate myself from my blanket and tiptoe through the cavern until I find Finnick, feeling for some unspecified reason that he will understand. He sits under the safety light in his space, nodding his rope, not even pretending to rest. As I whisper my discovery of Snow's plan to break me, it dawns on me. This strategy is very old news to Finnick. It's what broke him. This is what they're doing to you with Annie, isn't it? I ask. Well, they didn't arrest her because they thought she'd be a wealth of rebel information, he says. They know I'd never have risked telling her anything like that for her own protection. Oh, Finnick, I'm so sorry, I say. No. I'm sorry, but I didn't warn you somehow, he tells me. Suddenly, a memory surfaces. I'm strapped to my bed, mad with rage and grief after the rescue. Finnick is trying to console me about Peter. They'll figure out he doesn't know anything pretty fast, and they won't kill him if they think they can use him against you. You did warn me, though, on the hovercraft. Only when you said they'd use Peter against me, I thought you meant like bait, to lure me into the capital somehow, I say. I shouldn't have said even that. It was too late for it to be of any help to you. Since I hadn't warned you before the quarter quell, I should have shut up about how snow operates. Fennec yanks on the end of his rope, and an intricate knot becomes a straight line again. It's just that... I didn't understand when I met you. After your first games, I thought the whole romance was an act on your part. We all expected you'd continue that strategy, but it wasn't until Peter hit the force field and nearly died that I... Finnick hesitates. I think back to the arena, how I sobbed when Finnick revived Peter, the quizzical look on Finnick's face, the way he excused my behavior, blaming it on my pretend pregnancy. That you what? That I knew I'd misjudged you. That you do love him. I'm not saying in what way. Maybe you don't know yourself, but anyone paying attention could see how much you care about him, he says gently. Anyone? On Snow's visit before the victory tour, he challenged me to erase any doubts of my love for Peter. Convince me, Snow said. It seems, under that hot pink sky with Peter's life in limbo, I finally did. And in doing so, I gave him the weapon he needed to break me. Finnick and I sit for a long time in silence, watching the knots bloom and vanish before I can ask, how do you bear it? Finnick looks at me in disbelief. I don't, Katniss. Obviously, I don't. I drag myself out of nightmares each morning and find there's no relief in waking. Something in my expression stops him. Better not to give in to it. It takes ten times as long to put yourself back together as it does to fall apart. Well, he must know. I take a deep breath, forcing myself back into one piece. The more you can distract yourself, the better, he says, 
First thing tomorrow, we'll get you your own rope. Until then, take mine. I spend the rest of the night on my mattress obsessively making knots, holding them up for Buttercup's inspection. If one looks suspicious, he swipes it out of the air and bites it a few times to make sure it's dead. By morning, my fingers are sore, but I'm still holding on. With twenty-four hours of quiet behind us, Coin finally announces we can leave the bunker. Our old quarters have been destroyed by the bombings. Everyone must follow exact directions to their new compartments. We clean our spaces as directed and file obediently toward the door. Before I'm halfway there, Boggs appears and pulls me from the line. He signals for Gale and Finnick to join us. People move aside to let us by. Some even smile at me, since the crazy cat game seems to have made me more lovable. Out the door, up the stairs, down the hall to one of those multi-directional elevators, and finally we arrive at special defense. Nothing along our route has been damaged, but we are still very deep. Boggs ushers us into a room virtually identical to command. Coin, Plutarch, Hamish, and Cressida, and everybody else around the table looks exhausted. Someone has finally broken out the coffee, although I'm sure it's viewed only as an emergency stimulant. And Plutarch has both hands wrapped tightly around his cup, as if at any moment it might be taken away. There's no small talk. We need all four of you suited up and above ground, says the President. You have two hours to get footage showing the damage from the bombing. Establish that 13's military unit remains not only functional, but dominant, and most important, that the Mockingjay is still alive. Any questions? Can we have a coffee? asks Finnick. Steaming cups are handed out. I stare distastefully at the shiny black liquid, never having been much of a fan of the stuff but thinking it might help me stay on my feet. Finnick sloshes some cream in my cup and reaches into the sugar bowl. Want a sugar cube? He asks in his old seductive voice. That's how we met, with Finnick offering me sugar. Surrounded by horses and chariots, costumed and painted for the crowds, before we were allies, before I had any idea what made him tick. The memory actually coaxes a smile out of me. Here, it improves the taste, he says, in his real voice, funking three cubes in my cup. As I turn to go suit up as the Mockingjay, I catch Gale watching me and Finnick unhappily. What now? Does he actually think something's going on between us? Maybe he saw me go to Finnick's last night, I would have passed the Hawthorne space to get there. I guess that probably rubbed in the wrong way, me seeking out Finnick's company instead of his. Well, fine. I've got rope burn on my fingers, I can barely hold my eyes open, and a camera crew's waiting for me to do something brilliant. And Snow's got Peter. Gail can think whatever he wants. In my new remake room in special defense, my prep team slaps me into my mocking jay suit, arranges my hair, and applies minimal makeup before my coffee's even cooled. In ten minutes, the cast and crew of the next propos are making the circuitous trek to the outside. I slurp my coffee as we travel, finding that the cream and sugar greatly enhance its flavor. As I knock back the dregs that have settled to the bottom of the cup, I feel a slight buzz start to run through my veins. After climbing a final ladder, Boggs hits a lever that opens a trap door. Fresh air rushes in. I take big gulps and for the first time allow myself to feel how much I hated the bunker. We emerge into the woods and my hands run through the leaves overhead. Some are just starting to turn. What day is it? I ask no one in particular. Boggs tells me September begins next week. 
September. That means Snow has had Peter in his clutches for five, maybe six weeks. I examine a leaf on my palm and see I'm shaking. I can't will myself to stop. I blame the coffee and try to focus on slowing my breathing, which is far too rapid for my pace. Debris begins to litter the forest floor. We come to our first crater, thirty yards wide, and I can't tell how deep. Very. Bog says anyone on the first ten levels would likely have been killed. We skirt the pit and continue on. Can you rebuild it? Gale asks. Not any time soon. That one didn't get much. A few backup generators and a poultry farm, says Boggs. We'll just seal it off. The trees disappear as we enter the area inside the fence. The craters are ringed with a mixture of old and new rubble. Before the bombing, very little of the current thirteen was above ground. A few guard stations, the training area. About a foot of the top floor of our building, where Buttercup's window jutted out, with several feet of steel on top of it. Even that was never meant to withstand more than a superficial attack. How much of an edge did the boy's warning give you? asks Hamish. About ten minutes before our own systems would have detected the missiles, says Boggs. But it did help, right? I ask. I can't bear it if he says no. Absolutely, Boggs replies. Civilian evacuation was completed. Seconds count when you're under attack. Ten minutes meant lives saved. Prim, I think, and Gale. They were in the bunker only a couple of minutes before the first missile hit. Peter might have saved them. Add their names to the list of things I can never stop owing him for. Cressida has the idea to film me in front of the ruins of the old Justice Building, which is something of a joke since the Capitol's been using it as a backdrop for fake news broadcasts for years to show that the district no longer existed. Now, with the recent attack, the Justice Building sits about ten yards away from the edge of a new crater. As we approach what used to be the grand entrance, Gale points out something, and the whole party slows down. I don't know what the problem is at first, and then I see the ground strewn with fresh pink and red roses. Don't touch them! I yell. They're for me! The sickeningly sweet smell hits my nose, and my heart begins to hammer against my chest. So I didn't imagine it. The rose on my dresser. Before me lies Snow's second delivery. Long-stemmed pink and red beauties, the very flowers that decorated the set where Peter and I performed our post-victory interview. Flowers not meant for one, but for a pair of lovers. I explain to the others as best I can. Upon inspection, they appear to be harmless, if genetically enhanced, flowers. Two dozen roses, slightly wilted, most likely dropped after the last bombing. A crew in special suits collects them and carts them away. I feel certain they will find nothing extraordinary in them, though. Snow knows exactly what he's doing to me. It's like having Cinna beaten to a pulp while I watch from my tribute tube, designed to unhinge me. Like then, I try to rally and fight back, but as Cressida gets Castor and Pollux in place, I feel my anxiety building. I'm so tired, so wired and so unable to keep my mind on anything but Peter since I've seen the roses. The coffee was a huge mistake. What I didn't need was a stimulant. My body visibly shakes, and I can't seem to catch my breath. After days in the bunker, I'm squinting no matter what direction I turn, and the light hurts. Even in the cool breeze, sweat trickles down my face. So what exactly do you need from me again? I ask. 
Just a few quick lines that show you're alive and still fighting, says Cressida. Okay. I take my position, and then I'm staring into the red light. Staring. Staring. I'm sorry. I've got nothing. Cressida walks up to me. You feeling okay? I nod. She pulls a small cloth from her pocket and blots my face. How about we do the old Q&A thing? Yeah, that would help, I think. I cross my arms to hide the shaking, glance at Finnick, who gives me a thumbs up, but he's looking pretty shaky himself. Cressid is back in position now. So, Katniss, you've survived the capital bombing of Thirteen. How did it compare with what you experienced on the ground in Eight? We were so far underground this time, there was no real danger. Thirteen's alive and well, and so am... My voice cuts off in a dry, squeaking sound. Try the line again, says Cressida. Thirteen's alive and well, and so am I. I take a breath, trying to force air down into my diaphragm. Thirteen's alive, and so... No, that's wrong. I swear I can still smell those roses. Katniss, just this one line, and you're done today. I promise, says Cressida. Thirteen's alive and well, and so am I. I swing my arms to loosen myself up, place my fists on my hips, then drop them to my sides. Saliva's filling my mouth at a ridiculous rate, and I feel vomit at the back of my throat. I swallow hard and open my lips so I can get the stupid line out and go hide in the woods, and that's when I start crying. It's impossible to be the Mockingjay. Impossible to complete even this one sentence, because now I know that everything I say will be directly taken out on Peter, result in his torture, but not his death, no, nothing so merciful as that. Snow will ensure that his life is much worse than death. Cut, I hear Cressida say quietly. What's wrong with her? Plutarch says under his breath. She's figured out how Snow's using Peter, says Finnick. There's something like a collective sigh of regret from the semicircle of people spread out before me. Because I know this now. Because there will never be a way for me to not know this again. Because beyond the military disadvantage losing a Mockingjay entails, I... I'm broken. Several sets of arms would embrace me, but in the end, the only person I truly want to comfort me is Hamish, because he loves Peter, too. I reach out for him and say something like his name, and he's there, holding me and patting my back. It's okay. It'll be okay, sweetheart. He sits me on a length of broken marble pillar, and keeps an arm around me while I sob. I can't do this anymore, I say. I know, he says. All I can think of is what he's going to do to Peter, because I'm the Mockingjay. I get out. I know. Hamish's arm tightens around me. Did you see how weird he acted? What are they doing to him. I'm gasping for air between sobs, but I manage one last phrase. It's my fault. And then I cross some line into hysteria, and there's a needle in my arm, and the world slips away. It must be strong, whatever they shot into me, because it's a full day before I come to. My sleep wasn't peaceful, though. I have the sense of emerging from a world of dark, haunted places where I traveled alone. Hamish sits in the chair by my bed, his skin waxen, his eyes bloodshot. I remember about Peter 
can start to tremble again. Hamish reaches out and squeezes my shoulder. It's all right. We're going to try to get Peter out. What? That makes no sense. Plutarch's sending in a rescue team. He has people on the inside. He thinks we can get Peter back alive, he says. Why didn't we before? I say. Because it's costly. But everyone agrees this is the thing to do. It's the same choice we made in the arena, to do whatever it takes to keep you going. We can't lose the Mockingjay now. And you can't perform unless you know Snow can't take it out on Peter. Hamish offers me a cup. Here, drink something. I slowly sit up and take a sip of water. What do you mean, costly? He shrugs. Covers will be blown. People may die. But keep in mind that they're dying every day, and it's not just Peter. We're getting Annie out for Finnick, too. Where is he? I ask. Behind that screen, sleeping his sedative off. He lost it right after we knocked you out says Hamish. I smile a little, feel a bit less weak. Yeah, it was a really excellent shoot. You two cracked up, and Boggs left to arrange the mission to get Peter. We're officially in reruns. Well, if Boggs is leading it, that's a plus, I say. Oh, he's on top of it. It was volunteer only, but he pretended not to notice me waving my hand in the air, says Hamish. See? He's already demonstrated good judgment. Something's wrong. Hamish is trying a little too hard to cheer me up. It's not really his style. So who else volunteered? I think there were seven all together, he says evasively. I get a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. Who else, Hamish? I insist. Hamish finally drops the good-natured act. You know who else, Katniss. You know who stepped up first. Of course I do. Gale. Chapter 12 Today I might lose both of them. I try to imagine a world where both Gale's and Peter's voices have ceased. Hands stilled, eyes unblinking. I'm standing over their bodies, having a last look, leaving the room where they lie. But when I open the door to step out into the world, there's only a tremendous void, a pale gray nothingness that is all my future holds. Do you want me to have them sedate you until it's over? asks Hamish. He's not joking. This is a man who spent his adult life at the bottom of a bottle, trying to anesthetize himself against the capital's crimes. The sixteen-year-old boy who won the second quarter quell must have had people he loved, family, friends, a sweetheart maybe, that he fought to get back to. Where are they now? How is it that until Peter and I were thrust upon him, there was no one at all in his life? What did Snow do to them? No, I say. I want to go to the capital. I want to be part of the rescue mission. They're gone, says Hamish. How long ago did they leave? I could catch up. I could. What? What could I do? Hamish shakes his head. It'll never happen. You're too valuable and too vulnerable. There was talk of sending you to another district to divert the capital's attention while the rescue takes place, but no one felt you could handle it. Please, Hamish. I'm begging now. I have to do something. I can't just sit here waiting to hear if they died. There must be something I can do. All right. Let me talk to Plutarch. You stay put. But I can't. Hamish's footsteps are still echoing in the outer hall. When I fumble my way through the slit in the dividing curtain, 
to find Phoenix sprawled out on his stomach, his hands twisted in his pillowcase. Although it's cowardly, cruel even, to rouse him from the shadowy, muted drug land to stark reality, I go ahead and do it because I can't stand to face this by myself. As I explain our situation, his initial agitation mysteriously ebbs. Don't you see, Katniss? This will decide things, one way or the other. By the end of the day, they'll either be dead or with us. It's, it's more than we could hope for. Well, that's a sunny view of our situation. And yet there's something calming about the idea that this torment could come to an end. The curtain yanks back, and there's Hamish. He has a job for us, if we can pull it together. They still need post-bombing footage of 13. If we can get it in the next few hours, Beatty can air it leading up to the rescue, and maybe keep the Capitol's attention elsewhere. Yes, a distraction, says Finnick. A decoy of sorts. What we really need is something so riveting that even President Snow won't be able to tear himself away. Got anything like that? asks Hamish. Having a job that might help the mission snaps me into focus. While I knock down breakfast and get prepped, I try to think of what I might say. President Snow must be wondering how that blood-splattered floor and his roses are affecting me. If he wants me broken, then I will have to be whole. But I don't think I will convince him of anything by shouting a couple of defiant lines at the camera. Besides, that won't buy the rescue team any time. Outbursts are short. It's stories that take time. I don't know if it will work, but when the television crews all assembled above ground, I asked Cressida if she could start out by asking me about Peter. I take a seat on the fallen marble pillar, where I had my breakdown, wait for the red light, and Cressida's question. How did you meet Peter? she asks. And then I do the thing that Hamish has wanted since my first interview. I open up. When I met Peter, I was eleven years old, and I was almost dead. I talk about that awful day when I tried to sell the baby clothes in the rain, how Peter's mother chased me from the bakery door, and how he took a beating to bring me the loaves of bread that saved our lives. We had never even spoken. The first time I ever talked to Peter was on the train to the games. But he was already in love with you, says Cressida. I guess so. I allow myself a small smile. How are you doing with the separation? she asks. Not well. I know at any moment Snow could kill him, especially since he warned Thirteen about the bombing. It's a terrible thing to live with, I say. But because of what they're putting him through, I don't have any reservations any more about doing whatever it takes to destroy the capital. I'm finally free. I turn my gaze skyward and watch the flight of a hawk across the sky. President Snow once admitted to me that the capital was fragile. At the time, I didn't know what he meant. It was hard to see clearly because I was so afraid. Now I'm not. The capital's fragile because it depends on the districts for everything, food, energy, even the peacekeepers that police us. If we declare our freedom, the capital collapses. President Snow, thanks to you, I'm officially declaring mine today. I've been sufficient, if not dazzling. Everyone loves the bread story, but it's my message to President Snow that gets the wheels spinning in Plutarch's brain. He hastily calls Finnick and Hamish over, and they have a brief but intense conversation that I can see Hamish isn't happy with. Plutarch seems to win. Finnick, pale, but nodding his head by the end of it. As Finnick moves to take my seat before the camera, Hamish tells him, You don't have to do this. Yes, I do. 
if it will help her. Finnick balls up his rope in his hand. I'm ready. I don't know what to expect. A love story about Annie? An account of the abuses in District 4? But Finnick O'Dair takes a completely different tack. President Snow used to sell me. My body, that is. Finnick begins in a flat, removed tone. I wasn't the only one. If a victor is considered desirable, the president gives them as a reward, or allows people to buy them for an exorbitant amount of money. If you refuse, he kills someone you love. So you do it. That explains it, then. Finnick's parade of lovers in the capital. They were never real lovers. Just people like our old head peacekeeper, Cray, who bought desperate girls to devour and discard because he could. I want to interrupt the taping and beg Finnick's forgiveness for every false thought I've ever had about him. But we have a job to do, and I sense Finnick's role will be far more effective than mine. I wasn't the only one, but I was the most popular, he says, and perhaps the most defenseless, because the people I loved were so defenseless. To make themselves feel better, my patrons would make presents of money or jewelry, but I found a much more valuable form of payment. Secrets, I think. That's what Finnick told me his lovers paid him in. Only I thought the whole arrangement was by his choice. Secrets, he says, echoing my thoughts. And this is where you're going to want to stay tuned, President Snow, because so very many of them were about you. But let's begin with some of the others. Finnick begins to weave a tapestry so rich in detail that you can't doubt its authenticity. Tales of strange sexual appetites, betrayals of the heart, bottomless greed, and bloody power plays. Drunken secrets whispered over damp pillowcases in the dead of night. Finnick was someone bought and sold, a district slave, a handsome one, certainly, but in reality, harmless. Who would he tell? And who would believe him if he did? But some secrets are too delicious not to share. I don't know the people Finnick names. All seem to be prominent capital citizens. But I know, from listening to the chatter of my prep team, the attention the most mild slip in judgment can draw. If a bad haircut can lead to hours of gossip, what will charges of incest, backstabbing, blackmail, and arson produce? Even as the waves of shock and recrimination roll over the capital, the people there will be waiting, as I am now, to hear about the President. And now, on to our good President Coriolanus Snow says Finnick. Such a young man when he rose to power, such a clever one to keep it. How, you must ask yourself, did he do it? One word. That's all you really need to know. Poison. Finnick goes back to Snow's political ascension, which I know nothing of, and works his way up to the present, pointing out case after case of the mysterious deaths of Snow's adversaries, or even worse, his allies who had the potential to become threats. People dropping dead at a feast, or slowly, inexplicably, declining into shadows over a period of months. Blamed on bad shellfish, elusive viruses, or an overlooked weakness in the aorta. Snow, drinking from the poisoned cup himself to deflect suspicion. But antidotes don't always work. They say that's why he wears the roses that reek of perfume. 
They say it's to cover the scent of blood from the mouth sores that will never heal. They say, they say, they say. Snow has a list, and no one knows who will be next. Poison, the perfect weapon for a snake. Since my opinion of the capital and its noble president are already so low, I can't say Finnick's allegations shock me. They seem to have far more effect on the displaced capital rebels, like my crew and Fulvia. Even Plutarch occasionally reacts in surprise, maybe wondering how a specific tidbit passed him by. When Finnick finishes, they just keep the cameras rolling until finally he has to be the one to say, Cut. The crew hurries inside to edit the material, and Plutarch leads Finnick off for a chat, probably to see if he has any more stories. I'm left with Hamish in the rubble, wondering if Finnick's fate would have one day been mine. Why not? Snow could have gotten a really good price for the girl on fire. Is that what happened to you? I ask Hamish. No. My mother and younger brother, my girl, they were all dead two weeks after I was crowned victor. Because of that stunt I pulled with the force field, he answers, Snow had no one to use against me. I'm surprised he didn't just kill you, I say. Oh no, I was the example. The person to hold up to the young Phoenix and Joannas and Cashmere's of what could happen to a victor who caused problems, says Hamish. But he knew he had no leverage against me. Until Peter and I came along, I say softly, I don't even get a shrug in return. With our job done, there's nothing left for Finnick and me to do but wait. We try to fill the dragging minutes in special defense, tie knots, push our lunch around our bowls, blow things up on the shooting range. Because of the danger of detection, no communication comes from the rescue team. At 1500, the designated hour, we stand tense and silent in the back of a room full of screens and computers and watch Beatty and his team try to dominate the airwaves. His usual fidgety distraction is replaced with a determination I have never seen. Most of my interview doesn't make the cut, just enough to show I'm alive and still defiant. It is Phoenix's salacious and gory account of the capital that takes the day. Is Beatty's skill improving, or are his counterparts in the capital a little too fascinated to want to tune Finnick out? For the next sixty minutes, the capital feed alternates between the standard afternoon newscast, Finnick, and attempts to black it all out. But the rebel techno team manages to override even the latter, and in a real coup, keeps control for almost the entire attack on snow. Let it go, says Beatty, throwing up his hands, relinquishing the broadcast back to the capital. He mops his face with a cloth. If they're not out of there by now, they're all dead. He spins in his chair to see me and Finnick reacting to his words. It was a good plan, though. Did Plutarch show it to you? Of course not. Beatty takes us to another room and shows us how the team, with the help of rebel insiders, will attempt, have attempted, to free the victors from an underground prison. It seems to have involved knockout gas distributed by the ventilation system, a power failure, the detonation of a bomb in a government building several miles from the prison, and now the disruption of the broadcast. Beatty's glad we find the plan hard to follow, because then our enemies will too. Like your electricity trap in the arena, I ask. Exactly. And see how well that worked out, says Beatty. Well, not really, I think. Finnick and I try to station ourselves in command, where surely first word of the rescue will come. 
but we are barred because serious war business is being carried out. We refuse to leave special defense and end up waiting in the hummingbird room for news. Making knots, making knots, no word, making knots, tick-tock. This is a clock. Do not think of Gale, do not think of Peta, making knots. We do not want dinner, fingers raw and bleeding. Finnick finally gives up and assumes the hunched position he took in the arena when the Jabberjays attacked. I perfect my miniature noose. The words of the hanging tree replay in my head. Gale and Peter, Peter and Gale. Did you love Annie right away, Finnick? I ask. No. A long time passes before he adds. She crept up on me. I search my heart, but at the moment, the only person I can feel creeping up on me is snow. It must be midnight. It must be tomorrow, when Hamish pushes open the door. They're back. We're wanted in the hospital. My mouth opens with a flood of questions that he cuts off with, That's all I know. I want to run, but Phoenix acting so strange, as if he's lost the ability to move, so I take his hand and lead him like a small child. Through special defense, into the elevator that goes this way and that, and on to the hospital wing. The place is in an uproar, with doctors shouting orders and the wounded being wheeled through the halls in their beds. We're sideswiped by a gurney bearing an unconscious, emaciated young woman with a shaved head. Her flesh shows bruises and oozing scabs. Joanna Mason, who actually knew rebel secrets, at least the one about me, and this is how she has paid for it. Through a doorway, I catch a glimpse of Gale, stripped to the waist, perspiration streaming down his face as a doctor removes something from under his shoulder blade with a long pair of tweezers. Wounded, but alive. I call his name, start toward him, until a nurse pushes me back and shuts me out. Phoenix! Something between a shriek and a cry of joy. A lovely, if somewhat bedraggled young woman, dark, tangled hair, sea-green eyes, runs toward us in nothing but a sheet. Finnick! And suddenly, it's as if there's no one in the world but these two, crashing through space to reach each other. They collide, enfold, lose their balance, and slam against a wall where they stay, clinging into one being, indivisible. A pang of jealousy hits me, not for either Finnick or Annie, but for their certainty. No one seeing them could doubt their love. Boggs, looking a little worse for wear but uninjured, finds Hamish and me. We got them all out, except Inabaria. But since she's from two... We doubt she's being held anyway. Pete is at the end of the hall. The effects of the gas are just wearing off. You should be there when he wakes. Peter, alive and well. Maybe not well, but alive and here. Away from snow, safe, here, with me. In a minute, I can touch him. See his smile, hear his laugh. Hamish is grinning at me. Come on, then, he says. I'm light-headed with giddiness. What will I say? Oh, who cares what I say? Peter will be ecstatic no matter what I do. He'll probably be kissing me anyway. I wonder if it will feel like those last kisses on the beach in the arena, the ones I haven't dared let myself consider until this moment. Peter's awake already, sitting on the side of the bed, looking bewildered as a trio of doctors reassure him. Flash lights in his eyes. Check his pulse. I'm disappointed, 
that mine was not the first face he saw when he woke, but he sees it now. His features register disbelief, and something more intense that I can't quite place. Desire? Desperation? Surely both. For he sweeps the doctors aside, leaps to his feet, and moves toward me. I run to meet him, my arms extended to embrace him. His hands are reaching for me, too, to caress my face, I think. My lips are just forming his name when his fingers lock around my throat. Chapter 13 The cold collar chafes my neck and makes the shivering even harder to control. At least I am no longer in the claustrophobic tube while the machines click and whir around me listening to a disembodied voice telling me to hold still while I try to convince myself I can still breathe. Even now, when I've been assured there will be no permanent damage, I hunger for air. The medical team's main concerns, damage to my spinal cord, airway, veins, and arteries, have been allayed. Bruising, hoarseness, the sore larynx, this strange little cough, not to be worried about. It will all be fine. The mocking jay will not lose her voice. Where, I want to ask, is the doctor who determines if I'm losing my mind? Only I'm not supposed to talk right now. I can't even thank Boggs when he comes to check on me. To look me over and tell me he's seen a lot worse injuries among the soldiers when they teach chokeholds in training. It was Boggs who knocked out Peter with one blow before any permanent damage could be done. I know Hamish would have come to my defense if he hadn't been utterly unprepared. To catch both Hamish and myself off guard is a rare thing. But we have been so consumed with saving Peter, so tortured by having him in the capital's hands, that the elation at having him back blinded us. If I'd had a private reunion with Peter, he would have killed me, now that he's deranged. No, not deranged, I remind myself. Hijacked. That's the word I heard pass between Plutarch and Hamish as I was wheeled past them in the hallway. Hijacked. I don't know what it means. Prim who appeared moments after the attack, and has stayed as close to me as possible ever since, spreads another blanket over me. I think they'll take the collar off soon, Katniss. You won't be so cold, then. My mother, who's been assisting in a complicated surgery, has still not been informed of Peter's assault. Prim takes one of my hands, which is clutched in a fist, and massages it until it opens and blood begins to flow through my fingers again. She's starting on the second fist when the doctors show up, remove the collar, and give me a shot of something for pain and swelling. I lie, as instructed, with my head still, not aggravating the injuries to my neck. Plutarch, Hamish, and Beatty have been waiting in the hall for the doctors to give them clearance to see me. I don't know if they've told Gail, but since he's not here, I assume they haven't. Plutarch ushers the doctors out and tries to order Prim to go as well, but she says, No, if you force me to leave, I'll go directly to surgery and tell my mother everything that's happened. And I warn you, she doesn't think much of a game maker calling the shots on Katniss's life especially when you've taken such poor care of her. Plutarch looks offended, but Hamish chuckles. I'd let it go, Plutarch, he says. Prim stays. So, Katniss, Peter's condition has come as a shock to all of us, says Plutarch. We couldn't help but notice his deterioration in the last two interviews. Obviously, he'd been abused, 
and we put his psychological state down to that. Now we believe something more was going on, that the capital has been subjecting him to a rather uncommon technique known as hijacking. Beatty? I'm sorry, Beatty says, but I can't tell you all the specifics of it, Katniss. The capital's very secretive about this form of torture, and I believe the results are inconsistent. This we do know. It's a type of fear conditioning. The term hijack comes from an old English word that means to capture, or even better, seize. We believe it was chosen because the technique involves the use of tracker-jacker venom and the jack suggested hijack. You were stung in your first Hunger Games, so unlike most of us, you have first-hand knowledge of the effects of the venom. Terror, hallucinations, nightmarish visions of losing those I love. Because the venom targets the part of the brain that houses fear. I'm sure you remember how frightening it was. Did you also suffer mental confusion in the aftermath? asks Beatty. A sense of being unable to judge what was true and what was false? Most people who have been stung and live to tell about it report something of the kind. Yes. That encounter with Peter. Even after I was clear-headed, I wasn't sure if he had saved my life by taking on Cato, or if I'd imagined it. Recall is made more difficult because memories can be changed. Beatty taps his forehead. Brought to the forefront of your mind, altered, and saved again in the revised form. Now, imagine that I ask you to remember something either with a verbal suggestion or by making you watch a tape of the event. And while that experience is refreshed, I give you a dose of tracker jacker venom, not enough to induce a three-day blackout, just enough to infuse the memory with fear and doubt. And that's what your brain puts in long-term storage. I start to feel sick. Prim asks the question that's in my mind. Is that what they've done to Peter? Taken his memories of Katniss and distorted them so they're scary? Beatty nods. So scary that he'd see her as life-threatening. That he might try to kill her. Yes, that's our current theory. I cover my face with my arms because this isn't happening. It isn't possible. For someone to make Peter forget he loves me, no one could do that. But you can reverse it, right? asks Prim. Um, very little data on that, says Plutarch. None, really. If hijacking rehabilitation has been attempted before, we have no access to those records. Well, you're going to try, aren't you? Prim persists. You're not just going to lock him up in some padded room and leave him to suffer. Of course we'll try, Prim, says Beatty. It's just we don't know to what degree we'll succeed, if any. My guess is that fearful events are the hardest to root out. They're the ones we naturally remember the best, after all. And apart from his memories of Katniss, we don't yet know what else has been tampered with, says Plutarch. We're putting together a team of mental health and military professionals to come up with a counterattack. I personally feel optimistic that he'll make a full recovery. Do you? asks Prim caustically. And what do you think, Hamish? I shift my arms slightly so I can see his expression through the crack. He's exhausted and discouraged, as he admits. I think Peter might get somewhat better, but I don't think he'll ever be the same. I snap my arms back together, closing the crack, shutting them all out. At least he's alive, says Plutarch, as if he's losing patience with the lot of us. Snow executed Peter's stylist and his prep team on live television tonight. 
We've no idea what happened to Effie Trinket. Peter's damaged, but he's here with us. And that's a definite improvement over his situation twelve hours ago. Let's keep that in mind, all right? Plutarch's attempt to cheer me up, laced with the news of another four, possibly five, murders, somehow backfires. Portia? Peter's prep team? Effie? The effort to fight back tears makes my throat throb until I'm gasping again. Eventually, they have no choice but to sedate me. When I wake, I wonder if this will be the only way I sleep now, with drugs shot into my arm. I'm glad I'm not supposed to talk for the next few days, because there's nothing I want to say or do. In fact, I'm a model patient. My lethargy taken for restraint, obedience to the doctor's orders. I no longer feel like crying. In fact, I can only manage to hold on to one simple thought, an image of Snow's face accompanied by the whisper in my head, I will kill you. My mother and Prim take turns nursing me, coaxing me to swallow bites of soft food. People come in periodically to give me updates on Peter's condition. The high levels of tracker-jacker venom are working their way out of his body. He's being treated only by strangers, natives of thirteen. No one from home or the capital has been allowed to see him, to keep any dangerous memories from triggering. A team of specialists works long hours designing a strategy for his recovery. Gail's not supposed to visit me, as he's confined to bed with some kind of shoulder wound. But on the third night, after I've been medicated and the lights turned down low for bedtime, he slips silently into my room. He doesn't speak, just runs his fingers over the bruises on my neck with a touch as light as moth wings, plants a kiss between my eyes, and disappears. The next morning I'm discharged from the hospital with instructions to move quietly and speak only when necessary. I'm not imprinted with a schedule, so I wander around aimlessly until Prim's excused from her hospital duties to take me to our family's latest compartment, 2212, identical to the last one, but with no window. Buttercup has now been issued a daily food allowance and a pan of sand that's kept under the bathroom sink. As Prim tucks me into bed, he hops up on my pillow, vying for her attention. She cradles him but stays focused on me. Katniss, I know this whole thing with Peter is terrible for you, but remember, Snow worked on him for weeks, and we've only had him for a few days. There's a chance that the old Peter, the one who loves you, is still inside, trying to get back to you. Don't give up on him. I look at my little sister and think how she has inherited the best qualities our family has to offer. My mother's healing hands, my father's level head, and my fight. There's something else there as well something entirely her own, an ability to look into the confusing mess of life and see things for what they are. Is it possible she could be right, that Peter could return to me? I have to get back to the hospital, Prim says, placing Buttercup on the bed beside me. You two keep each other company, okay? Buttercup springs off the bed and follows her to the door, complaining loudly when he's left behind. We're about as much company for each other as dirt. After maybe thirty seconds, I know I can't stand being confined in the subterranean cell and leave Buttercup to his own devices. I get lost several times, but eventually I make my way down to special defense. Everyone I pass stares at the bruises, and I can't help feeling self-conscious to the point that I tug my collar up to my ears. Gail must have been released from the hospital this morning as well, 
because I find him in one of the research rooms with Beatty. They're immersed, heads bent over a drawing, taking a measurement. Versions of the picture litter the table and floor. Tacked on the corkboard walls and occupying several computer screens are other designs of some sort. In the rough lines of one, I recognize Gale's twitch-up snare. What are these? I ask hoarsely, pulling their attention from the sheet. Ah, Cutlass, who found us out? says Beatty cheerfully. What, is this a secret? I know Gale's been down here working with Beatty a lot, but I assumed they were messing around with bows and guns. Not really, but I felt a little guilty about it, stealing Gale away from you so much, Beatty admits. Since I've spent most of my time in Thirteen disoriented, worried, angry, being remade or hospitalized, I can't say Gale's absences have inconvenienced me. Things haven't been exactly harmonious between us either, but I let Beatty think he owes me. I hope you've been putting his time to good use. Come and see, he says, waving me over to a computer screen. This is what they've been doing, taking the fundamental ideas behind Gale's traps and adapting them into weapons against humans. Bombs, mostly. It's less about the mechanics of the traps than the psychology behind them. Booby-trapping an area that provides something essential to survival, a water or food supply. Frightening prey so that a large number flee into a greater destruction endangering offspring in order to draw in the actual desired target, the parent, luring the victim into what appears to be a safe haven, where death awaits it. At some point, Gale and Beatty left the wilderness behind and focused on more human impulses, like compassion, a bomb explodes. Time is allowed for people to rush to the aid of the wounded, then a second, more powerful bomb kills them as well. That seems to be crossing some kind of line, I say. So anything goes? They both stare at me, beady with doubt, gale with hostility. I guess there isn't a rule book for what might be unacceptable to do to another human being. Sure there is. Beatty and I have been following the same rule book President Snow used when he hijacked PETA, says Gale. Cruel, but to the point. I leave without further comment. I feel if I don't get outside immediately, I'll just go ballistic. But I'm still in special defense when I'm waylaid by Hamish. Come on, he says. We need you back up at the hospital. What for? I ask. They're going to try something on PETA, he answers. Send in the most innocuous person from 12 they can come up with. Find someone PETA might share childhood memories with, but nothing too close to you. They're screening people now. I know this will be a difficult task, since anyone PETA shares childhood memories with would most likely be from town, and almost none of those people escaped the flames. But when we reach the hospital room that has been turned into a workspace for Peter's recovery team, there she sits chatting with Plutarch, Delhi Cartwright. As always, she gives me a smile that suggests I'm her best friend in the world. She gives this smile to everyone. Katniss, she calls out. Hey, Delhi, I say. I'd heard she and her younger brother had survived. Her parents, who ran the shoe shop in town, weren't as lucky. She looks older, wearing the drab thirteen clothes that flatter no one, with her long yellow hair in a practical braid instead of curls. Delly's a bit thinner than I remember, but she was one of the few kids in District 12 with a couple of pounds to spare. The diet here, the stress, the grief of losing her parents have all, no doubt, contributed. How are you doing? I ask. Oh, it's been a lot of changes all at once, 
her eyes fill with tears. But everyone's really nice here in 13, don't you think? Delly means it. She genuinely likes people, all people, not just a select few she's spent years making up her mind about. They've made an effort to make us feel welcome, I say. I think that's a fair statement without going overboard. Are you the one they've picked to see Peter? I guess so. Poor Peter. Poor you. I'll never understand the capital, she says. Better not to, maybe, I tell her. Dolly's known Peter for a long time, says Plutarch. Oh, yes, Dolly's face brightens. We played together from when we were little. I used to tell people he was my brother. What do you think? Hamish asks me. Anything that might trigger memories of you? We were all in the same class, but we never overlapped much, I say. Katniss was always so amazing. I never dreamed she would notice me, says Delly. The way she could hunt and go in the hob and everything. Everyone admired her so. Hamish and I both have to take a hard look at her face to double-check if she's joking. To hear Delly describe it, I had next to no friends because I intimidated people by being so exceptional. Not true. I had next to no friends because I wasn't friendly. Leave it to Delly to spin me into something wonderful. Delly always thinks the best of everyone, I explain. I don't think Peter could have bad memories associated with her. Then I remember. Wait, in the capital, when I lied about recognizing the Avox girl, Peter covered for me and said she looked like Delly. I remember, says Hamish, but I don't know. It wasn't true. Delly wasn't actually there. I don't think it can compete with years of childhood memories. Especially with such a pleasant companion as Delly, says Plutarch. Let's give it a shot. Plutarch, Hamish, and I go to the observation room next to where Peter's confined. It's crowded with ten members of his recovery team armed with pens and clipboards. The one-way glass and audio setup allows us to watch Peter secretly. He lies on the bed, his arms strapped down. He doesn't fight the restraints, but his hands fidget continuously. His expression seems more lucid than when he tried to strangle me, but it's still not one that belongs to him. When the door quietly opens, his eyes widen in alarm, then become confused. Delly crosses the room tentatively, but as she nears him, she naturally breaks into a smile. Pina! It's Delly! From home! Delly? Some of the clouds seem to clear. Delly! It's you! Yes! she says with obvious relief. How do you feel? Awful. Where are we? What happened? asks Peter. Here we go, says Hamish. I told her to steer clear of any mention of Katniss or the capital, says Plutarch. Just see how much of home she could conjure up. Well, we're in District 13. We live here now, says Delly. That's what those people have been saying. But it makes no sense. Why aren't we home? asks Peter. Delly bites her lip. There was an accident. I miss home badly, too. I was only just thinking about those chalk drawings we used to do on the paving stones. Yours were so wonderful. Remember when you made each one a different animal? Yeah, pigs and cats and things, says Peter. You said about an accident? I can see the sheen of sweat on Delly's forehead as she tries to work around the question. It was bad. No one could stay, she says haltingly. Hang in there, girl, says Hamish. But I know you're going to like it here, Peter. 
The people have been really nice to us. There's always food and clean clothes, and school's much more interesting, says Deli. Why hasn't my family come to see me? Peter asks. They can't. Deli's tearing up again. A lot of people didn't get out of twelve, so we'll need to make a new life here. I'm sure they could use a good baker. Do you remember when your father used to let us make dough girls and boys? There was a fire, Peter says suddenly. Yes, she whispers. Well, burned down, didn't it? Because of her, says Peter angrily. Because of Katniss. He begins to pull on the restraints. Oh, no, Peter, it wasn't her fault, says Deli. Did she tell you that? He hisses at her. Get her out of there, says Plutarch. The door opens immediately, and Deli begins to back toward it, slowly. She didn't have to. I was, Deli begins. Because she's lying. She's a liar. You can't believe anything she says. She's some kind of mutt the Capitol created to use against the rest of us, Peter shouts. No, Peter, she's not a... Deli tries again. Don't trust her, Deli, says Peter in a frantic voice. I did, and she tried to kill me. She killed my friends, my family. Don't even go near her. She's a mutt. A hand reaches through the doorway, pulls Deli out, and the door swings shut. But Peter keeps yelling, A mutt! She's a stinking mutt! Not only does he hate me and want to kill me, he no longer believes I'm human. It was less painful being strangled. Around me the recovery team members scribble like crazy, taking down every word. Hamish and Plutarch grab my arms and propel me out of the room. They lean me up against a wall in the silent hallway. But I know Peter continues to scream behind the door and the glass. Prim was wrong. Peter is irretrievable. I can't stay here any more, I say numbly. If you want me to be the Mockingjay, you'll have to send me away. Where do you want to go? asks Hamish. The capital. It's the only place I can think of where I have a job to do. Can't do it, Plutarch says. Not until all the districts are secure. Good news is the fighting's almost over in all of them, but... Two. It's a tough nut to crack, though. That's right. First the districts, next the capital, and then I hunt down snow. Fine, I say. Send me to two.